and we're hopeful in looking to work with um, the developer in increasing that number substantially. And by substantially, we mean like 50 percent. Right. Um, so not, some people not, are saying like by by, uh, you know, Crenshaw Subway Coalition and others saying, well, we don't want any housing built here. It kind of created a situation where CIM Group, which, as you mentioned, has big and lucrative deals with the uh, Trump family and the Kushner family, you know, and basically we're talking about Trump BFFs coming in and buying the mall right in the middle of our community. Um, and some folks say you guys pushed them there by not allowing any flexibility to developers and not allowing the um, apartments to be built. I wish we were that powerful. Um, now, while we did file and, and uh, are very proud to see that it's still moving forward because it's it be groundbreaking, legis- groundbreaking litigation, um, a Federal Housing Act complaint by basically saying by having a, a, a project that would price out, that would be too expensive for black and brown people, and then push out those that live in the surrounding area, it was a violation of the Fair Housing Act, which we all know was, you know, signed into law by uh, days after Dr. King had died. Uh, it was one of the major contentions and points uh, that he was fighting for prior to his death in Memphis. Um, but the reality is the mall was going to be sold. And the challenge was that uh, the black person who sought to buy it from the funds again had said that they'd lost con- the, the pension funds that he was going to to bring in the money had lost confidence in him. But the mall, now that we found out, has been on the block for over a year. The fund that was used to buy the mall was going to liquidate the asset. Legally, it was supposed to liquidate the asset sometime in 2017, 2018, which actually makes you question what was all the fanfare uh, regarding 2018? Was it just, which we see a lot, and we saw this on another development just down the street in South Central, the reef across the street from um, Los Angeles Trade Tech College, where a developer comes in with no intent to actually build the project, but they get what's known as entitlement. They get the approval of the city to build it, which increases the value of the site, and then they sell it to someone else. That was what looked like was taking place here. Hmm. Okay, well, here's another question. It's more philosophical, and I'm going to go to the phones after that. Um, How much say do people typically have i mean this is right capitalism this is a private business right i mean how much say can we really have in how much say do people have in other communities about what happens with these huge developments a b we're talking about a mall which are meant to be are supposedly an endangered species at this point anyway right i mean and and so there's two points let's take the first one um the second one first Right, we don't even know if this mall is going to reopen once the COVID nineteen uh, lockdown orders um, pull back. I mean, Basics is having difficulty. Forever Twenty One struggled, and those are the two major uh, anchor stores now. There, since Sears has left, obviously the Walmart left several years ago. Um, and even when it comes to the movie theater, how long will it be before people feel comfortable sitting in a confined space, even six feet six feet distance, watching a movie? Right. But this to be clear, the Macy's is not part of the sale. That's a separate. But it's an That's anchor. Separate thing. It, yeah. It's but an yeah, anchor. I'm just saying it's any, not any part of mall. what's being sold. The the Walmart, I think, and the Macy's are the two things that are not included, right? Well, no, the Walmart is actually part of it. It's actually the the building that's where the IHOP is located, all the way down to the check cashing place, Baskin Robbins. That's a separate property in and of itself. And okay. the Macy's is a separate property in and of itself. And those neither of those sites um, are within the deal, but. To be able to have a thriving um, retail mall um, where you've got now over nearly 900,000 square feet, actually more accurately 186, 167, excuse me, 167 square feet, 1,000 square feet, you need to have an anchor, a key draw. And if the movie theater is not the key draw, and if the Macy's might not reopen, it becomes extremely difficult. So that's the first piece on that point. The second piece on that point is when this mall was going out to be bid, Nobody, and this was the quiet secret, nobody that was bidding was trying to either build the plan that had been approved by the city council and contested by the Crenshaw Assembly Coalition in court in 2018. Everyone had a different vision of the mall. They were really seeing it as 43 acres in the middle of uh, a, a transitioning, is the real estate term, meaning gentrifying community um, that uh, was developable land. They were going to have to come back to the community and re-envision it. Um, and, and, and that's the, that gets to the, to the first point you made. But 
what we announced um, and what we're demanding of this project and many others is that we reclaim this insane process, like where we have critical assets. And, and the Crenshaw Mall is very unique in that its value is largely predicated today on the creation of public investment in the transit station that's being built. Crenshaw Subway Coalition fought hard for that line to be built in, 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 in coalition with a broad community group. And the value is created from that. That's the first. And the second is, there's a long history and hundreds of billions of dollars in, in direct public granting and financing uh, that came from CRA under the leadership then uh, or guidance of, of Tom Bradley and Bill Elkins to make the mall what it was today. So why do we continue to provide either through new infrastructure or direct dollars and financing? Uh, why do we continue to provide the resources for um, companies to come in, profit from it, and then not listen to the community, not build for the community and with the community? And so what we're trying to do, and we've seen this take place in other parts of the, of the, of the city and country, is reclaim that process. Talk about what it would mean if the community owned that mall, what it would mean and what community, um, community-centered community de- development look like. Um, and, you know, I'm pleased to see that uh, in an amazing coalition of, in some respects, rivals, people that don't necessarily agree on everything, have come together with over 200 years of finance acquisition and development experience, have put that talent, um, put that talent on the table, brought themselves to a table to make that happen, to identify the resources, um, to, to be able to, to match and if that exceed the offer that's being made by CIM and be in true community control uh, for determining what happens at the site. So, short version of that is you, you're you feeling like the community led by your organization can buy this mall themselves and then do what? So, the, 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 the community can buy the mall, right? And the resources that was made on... Um, the financing that was discussed uh, by Sister Dolores Brown on our uh, Zoom call on Saturday, that's not the challenge. Right now, the challenge is stopping the sale to CIM Group. And when when that happens, um, then we can submit that offer, that bid, um, after doing our due diligence on, you know, that's a requirement of the investors that are involved right now. And then beginning in a process of community vision and identification of community-centered development, IDing what we want. I mean, it's a paradigm shift, right? Let's go from trying to respond to what a developer thinks. Often, never a developer within our community should go to the site to asking ourselves what we believe should be there. Asking right. ourselves what we want at the Crenshaw Mall site. Got it. All right, let's hit these phones. Let's go to Wendell calling from L.A. Good morning, Wendell. You're on with Damian hey, Goodman on the hey, front page. Hey, greetings, Dominique. Uh, you know, as I listen... Uh, I think of the Dunbar project that they did years, several years ago on Central, how they took that area full of blight and they put those homes up there and it renewed that area and it brought, it even brought more attention to the black historical aspect of that uh, whole Central Avenue thing with the jazz festival and everything. And I wish something similar that like that could happen with the Crenshaw Mall and then you can incorporate the... Uh, the Tuskegee Airmen that meet at the Water and Power office next to the Krispy Kreme there. See, a lot of those guys are, are, are passing on, transitioning on, and their legacy needs to continue. There could be uh, some type of memorial um, or for all that area, Crenshaw area that once was. And, of course, I know you have to infuse, I'm mindful that you have to infuse some new businesses there, like maybe you can get some some sprouts or Whole Foods type things there. But I'm really concerned about the long-term black businesses there that may not make the cut you know what you know what what will their fate be as well you're talking about you know, surrounding the mall not inside yeah, the, mall. the mall as well and, and and you know yeah but you know th- i mean i know you have to inject some some new uh uh, uh revenue in the area but i i like to know how he feels about incorporating the two because he is on the subway committee as well well, you know what, um, Wendell, there's a lot of questions in what you just brought up because, know. you know, Damien just said he was talking about the impact of COVID-19 on malls, but malls were already an endangered species before COVID-19. Everybody's shopping online. So malls are already trying to yeah. in- reinvent themselves as experiences rather than yeah. just shopping destinations. And now, 
you know, they can only do curbside pickup because they don't want people in enclosed spaces. So, you know, it's, there's there's that. Then, as you said, there are black small businesses in the mall and there are black businesses or community owned businesses surrounding the mall. Um so I guess, Damien, he's asking, like, you know, what business model can allow, you know, that historical preservation of the neighborhood and and allow the survival of these businesses? Right. I mean, I think that's why you've got, we need people, we need folk like Wendell to come to the table and, and talk about that, what he thinks would work. We have a, uh, on our website one of the key asks that we have for people is, do you operate a business that you think would want to go into the mall? Um, but we've got to recognize, and I think this is the part that you looked it up especially, Dominique, there are already businesses in that mall, um, many of them black and brown owned, that are struggling and have to be identified. These are the very businesses where CIM Group has basically intentionally said they want to push out, retenant is the term, um, where you push out um, the existing businesses and bring in um, those to generate more revenue that aren't necessarily owned by folk in our community. And so one of the key parts of this, I think, is, you know, even just within the discussion and absolutely as the community takes ownership of the mall is recognizing this is not a plain slate, even though, yes, the, the design um, and what happens there is going to change. We have people that operate businesses, folk in our community that work there, that need to first to be, as you think about crisis response, supported uh, and identify what they need in order to survive in uh, these COVID-19 times and thereafter. Let's go to Kadisha calling us from L.A. Good morning. Yes. Oh, good morning. Um, wonderful show. Thank you for being there to yourself and the guests. Uh, I just wanted to say I was uh, listening to the town hall meeting on Saturday and called in. And I love that great uh, enthusiasm from the community and knowing that there was over 400 uh, calls com- or people online listening uh, and also uh, that we were asked to call the Herb Wesson office uh, that's a councilman's office and I did and I, they returned my call yesterday and out of curiosity I asked them how many people had called in and they said they received about five calls so far and I'm just saying community come on we've got to pick up and Uh, really show the concern there because a friend had told me in Oakland that they have no black areas left at all and uh, and other places throughout the country so this is our this is our black pyramid this is our mecca our metropolis that mall uh, is indicative of our community and been standing strong for a long time with the pan-african uh uh, film festival going uh, or art show going on there and other great uh, book signings and, and it just is a wonderful place and it signifies something that we can own and I just love to support that in every way uh, you know because that's we could turn it into a um, what's the name of the place over there uh, by Third Street uh, I can't the Grove. The Grove, yeah, something on, on that level, and really have it as a tourist attraction with the uh, with the subway coming. I mean, what's called that? The, the Gold Line coming through. It has a potential to blossom and boom. These people have had their retail tell stores going on for many, many years. Uh, Sears and Roebuck, and all since my grandmother's days, and all that. And black folks have never really had an opportunity to do to do that. I think we can get in there and create businesses and bring the things from the Merck Park in there, uh, the businesses that are over there, or something to that nature. Um, by you know having a section of uh, like twenty to ten percent or. 40% where it's called affordable before they price us out totally and mm-hmm. won't be able to have any type of businesses there at all. So I well, love Kadisha, let me ask brother. you something because I, I mean, I, I agree with the vibe of what you're saying, but is that, and this is for Damian Goodman too, is that financially sustainable? Can this, and I don't even know if those Lamert Park stores want to move. Maybe they could have a satellite, but I know what you're talking about. The You're talking about the energy of our community being preserved and even elevated in that space um but can that sustain financially sustain a hundred million plus dollar you know ginormous mall 
Well, as I stated on the town hall meeting, we have black folks swimming in money right now. There's lots of millionaires. There's lots of billion, uh, well, some billionaires. And I believe if we galvanize together and we really put the word out, they should, we should be able to sustain. I mean, if we multi uh, change the purpose of it into like a, a concert arena or something, there's just maybe. Whenever concerts that. come back. <laughs> Well, I think it's yeah. prophetic that that 40 acres just happens to be 40 acres to me is prophetic because of, of, of us saying that where's our 40 acres. In a there meal. you go, Khadija. That could be what that could be the first 40 acres we get and then it wouldn't have yeah. to be profitable. OK, Hall- I feel hallelujah. You. <laughs> I appreciate the call. Damien Goodman, your response to what Khadija is saying. Well, I just appreciate the the energy and the, the love that Kadisha is uh, you know uh, you know exuding in, in her vision, um, and I think there's there's a couple of folks and, and we call it downtown Crenshaw for a reason, right? So when you think about a downtown, it's got multiple elements there. It has um, the housing, it has the office, it has the retail, it has the entertainment venue space or, or things of that nature that are seeking to create. Um, gathering and, and comfortability where everyone can vibe. Um, and you don't have to take from Lamar Park. We need to build up and continue seeing Lamar Park Village to be its strong self um, and other parts of South LA to continue to be strong economic um, anchors. Um, but, you know, we have a lot of businesses, and we make this point, we made this point on the, on the virtual town hall. We have a lot of businesses that are owned and operated by people in our community that are not anywhere close to Crenshaw, anywhere close to South LA, that need to be brought home, right? There are there if they are want to be to, brought home, yeah. <laughs> I think they, I think they would, and they do. Um, I think they've, and we know that the the office, and this is right, largely why people keep talking about office now. The type of office CIM wants to bring in is the type of office in Culver City to push us out, not necessarily the type of office for us. When you look at the I mean, is anyone in, from in Culver area? City? I wonder about the viability of that plan because uh, office space, everybody's working from home. Office buildings were already, you know, problematic before COVID-19. I don't know. Is anyone from Culver City going to come set up on Crenshaw? Maybe they will. I don't know. But either plan, any plan has to be viable from a business perspective. I mean, and, and to me, I'm just not hearing that. I'm not hearing it. Uh, from CIM, honestly, and so far I haven't heard it from us. Well, no, I, I think you are hearing it, and, and Dominique, what I'm saying is that you've got a mix of uses in a downtown to where one is not the, the, the key driving force behind it. I mean, the, the challenge, and I would push back, I mean, we know that even at 20% affordability or 30% affordability or even 40, 40% affordability, that when you bring in especially that many market rate units in a low-income community, and the surrounding area is the Tele 2 Crenshaws, right? You've got the Hill, which is View Park in Baldwin Hills, which is, you know, a stable black middle-class folk. And then you got people at the base of the Hill and the working class community surrounding it that is low-income. Right. And we got to be able to make sure, as we've been doing for a very long time, that all can buy together. And most importantly, that those who are already house insecure and um, being pushed out through gentrification are not further pushed out. So part of this, and again, advancing this is talking about creating that acquisition fund to take land off the speculative real estate market around the site. The community that's sort of in it today can be the community that, that enjoys the Right. So, I mean, that's, that's what Central. you're talking about, not just for the mall, but beyond the mall. You're talking about buying, uh, buying real estate, you know, through, you know, a community of organization so that it can be, you know, a force against gentrification, which sounds like a great plan. I, you know, I, I, speaking of pushback, I don't know how stable those middle class communities are at this point. Um, you know, I think what I see, because I'm probably one of those stable middle class homeowners that you're talking about in the Crenshaw area, is that there's a lot of pressure. There was already a lot of pressure before COVID-19, and now it's really bad. People are losing, uh, you know, jobs. Their their hours are being cut. Um, and so I don't, you know, I, I question how stable those middle class. I understand what you're saying about a tale of two Crenshaws, but I also think even that middle class uh, layer is being, is being threatened right now. And, you know, every single week i get a notification about how uh you know somebody wants to buy my house (laughs) 
from a Beverly Hills a real estate company or something like that. Um, and it's stepped up since coronavirus. Exactly. It's like the, the vultures are circling at this point. It's called disaster capitalism. I mean, people are seeing that people are under pressure, they're slowly we're stable, and we already had a, a significant portion of our even homeowners community, not the majority. Majority of our renters are extreme if it's around the Crenshaw Mall, and nearly two thirds of the people that's around the Crenshaw Mall are renters. Um, but even among the homeowners, we knew that a third of the black homeowners in the, that's around the Crenshaw Mall spend over 50% of their income in housing costs, right? And so those mm-hmm. are the folk, even before COVID-19, that were saying, you know, these are the folk who are going to be most at risk and vulnerable during the next economic downturn. We just didn't realize it was going to be, you know, we're on, we're on track to a depression here that's worse than the Great Depression. And so we've been working, and this is where the policy comes in, as part of coalitions to, to, to you know, talk to our federal officials, our local officials, our state officials about what needs to be done to make sure that this crisis does not result in, in, the, in does not have the same outcome in the last crisis where the vultures came and swooped up our, our property, our land at rock bottom prices and now have prices out of our community. So this, there's a, there's, this is a holistic piece. This is an ecosystem we're talking about building. I mean, I think downtown Crenshaw, the Crenshaw Mall specifically, is just one key in, in, in galvanizing campaign that we can win and we will win that we've identified a solution to. And, and, and strategy is to push out the CIM, Trump supporters, uh, Trump business partners, and bring in the community. But I think just in general, the fact that people are calling you right now, Dominique, still in this crisis, the fact that people are, are now looking at buying property on Crenshaw tells you that this is a long-term game. This is not a short-term fix, right? Nobody right. thinks that, nobody, nobody is looking at the mall, always looking to build at the mall. Um, something within a, a matter of years. It just, I hate to tell you that, you know, because I think a lot of people were promised a lot of pretty things. You know, this is going to be a multi year, multi phase long process, which actually is normal for a site that is this yeah. big. They didn't build Playa Vista overnight. Um, they they built sure it in didn't. Phases, right? <laughs> and so, what we want to do is to make sure that when that process begins, right, that we own the process, that we okay. are making the determination, that we have by that point already begun the acquisition or already succeeded in the acquisition of lots of the multifamily properties and even single family homes in the surrounding communities so that black folk and brown and our brown neighbors are here to enjoy the fruits. Lois from LA, you're on with Damian Goodman on the front page. Welcome. Okay, I don't want you guys to be mad at me, but I think what happened is up there too, you're talking about the loss of revenue. They took out that um, Walmart. I don't understand that at all. You took out the Walmart. Well, Walmart you, left. I mean, it, no one well, took it out. They out. just you pissed out. Put them out, right? So Walmart no. was a good no, thing. No, the, the, they weren't put out. I wish they were because I, I, you know, I'm not a Walmart shopper. I think they're the evil empire. Uh, but but, but it doesn't but, matter. Uh, no, I understand. I understand shopper. your point, though. I'm not disagreeing with you in terms of the fact that people utilize the store. But I don't think they were pushed out. I think they just left. I think that from what I've read, that Walmart is kind of not doing the city thing anymore. They retreated back to their roots, which is mostly country stores. Is that your understanding, Damien? Exactly. And they left. Um, and, and you know they didn't want us no more, Lois. what I think. I think they didn't want our money no more, Lois. My goodness, I used to work for Walmart. People used to talk about them. They weren't giving no help in this. They weren't doing this, but they had a lot of people and stuff. But still, nobody mm. liked them for some reason. I don't know why. Because a lot of Walmart workers were on food stamps because they weren't paying enough wages because they were hiring undocumented uh, people to clean up um, and paying them sub minimum wage. Lots of reasons. But that's not that is not even your point. Your point is we needed that business hub in the community. And what I'm saying is we didn't push them out. They left us. Right, and I think, you know, part of it, Dominique, is like us trying to, like, reframe and, and educate community in the process and bring to bear one of the amazing sisters that spoke uh, on the virtual town hall this weekend. It's Nikki. Nikki is part of a movement of seeking to create worker-owned cooperatives and, and worker-invested enterprises that don't exploit workers like Walmart. And, and, and as we have a little bit of runway and, and as we have seen this movement take place um, for decades, everywhere but L.A., right, you know, you go to the Bay Area where you're from, and you talk about cooperatives, and people already know it. You know, they use that cooperative bros within Oakland. Yeah. Okay, it, I, I, you, you're about to get me started. I got to take a break right here. That's, but that's a great tease because what about the Bay Area? You talk about cooperatives. Ooh, the gentrification there is on steroids. Um, so this is a conversation about the mall, and I want to talk when we get back about what 
is the outcome we're looking for? What is the possible outcome that we could see if we don't prevail? And what can people do? What are the solutions here? Uh, we're talking about the Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Mall, but we're really talking about the community and our future survival here in L.A. Damian Goodman is our guest, 520-KJLH. That's the number to call. It's radio free, 102.3 KJLH.